Okay, so welcome back. Um, this is part seven in our series where we show you how to convert your Arduino into an oscilloscope. And you can see the application we've been developing here. Um, I encourage you to take a look at the previous videos in the series. We cover a lot of information about showing how oscilloscopes work and how the Arduino works and some of its capabilities and limitations. Um, we also generate a block diagram of the functionality of this. So really you can generate this code in just about any software language. We're going to use C Sharp, um, but you can use the concepts to apply to just about any uh, software. In this video, we're going to look at some of the additional features we've added to this um, application, such as um, high speed mode. Uh, we've enabled high speed mode on the Arduino to allow you to capture higher frequencies. So we'll show you how to do that. We'll show you to how to do um, triggering where you can see here we are triggering our waveform. So it does like an oscilloscope and it, it kind of holds the uh, refresh of the waveform so they start at the same point so it's not bouncing all around. We'll show you how to do that here. Uh, we'll talk about AC and DC coupling, how to get average volts, maximum volts. We'll also talk about these track bars, how to get the track bars to work where we can adjust the scale of the uh, horizontal and vertical axes. So now let's talk about this high speed mode you see down here near the start button. Basically that allows you to select whether or not your Arduino is programmed for a very high speed analog read. Now we mentioned previously that the, the standard default analog read takes about a tenth of a millisecond per um, analog read. So if you've got a bunch of samples, you're doing a lot of samples, that can take a very long time. So High speed mode allows you to modify the Arduino through some unfortunately very counterintuitive code uh, to use a higher speed analog read. So um, when you click this high speed mode, you select it, you can see in our code when we start the scan using our trigger button, which is actually the start button, when we click that and it starts the scan, it has an if statement that says if that high speed uh, check button is checked, then the milliseconds per sample is 0 0.02 milliseconds. Um, it's actually a little bit less than that, but this is the high speed mode that you program into your Arduino. Else, otherwise, it's the standard 0.1 milliseconds. And if you're using high speed mode on the Arduino, um, this will modify how fast you do updates and, and the response of your oscilloscope application. So really pretty straightforward. Uh, much of the work is done in the Arduino. So let's look at the Arduino code that we need to implement that. So um, here is our code that we had before. Uh, analog pin A0, string receive string, number of birth samples. I've got some uh, start and stop times that are commented out. Um, but there's only like six lines of code we need to implement this. And these defines are two of those lines of code. Now, um, if you want to implement this, I encourage you to just copy and paste this because honestly, uh, it's, it's something I try and avoid is something like this that is very counterintuitive. Uh, it works. It works well, but you have to get into, you know, dealing directly with registers on the AT Mega 328, which I don't enjoy doing. So I encourage you to, to do these two defines and just copy and paste those. You may find them on the internet. So you've got these two defines. And then when you go down, the other three lines of code are in your void setup. We've got the standard serial begin where we set up the um, COM port for 2 million baud. And then the pin mode, analog pin, and then you've got these three lines of code you need to copy and paste, SBI and two CBIs. Once you implement those, make sure you've got all the capitalizations and everything correct. Uh, once you implement those, that's about all you need to go into high speed mode where you get a much higher um, analog read. Okay, so what other features do we want to think about adding to our application? Well, here I'm looking at a triangle wave from my uh, function generator and I'm on high speed mode. You can see I'm measuring 10 milliseconds and I've got a 50 millisecond buffer and you can see it's updating very quickly. It's pretty nice. Um, but one thing you might notice is it's kind of annoying. You know, it's bouncing around and um, wouldn't it be nice if it kind of 
froze in one place and not bounce around a lot. In the oscilloscope world, they have a function, a feature called triggering. What is triggering? Well, you notice here the each scan, each burst of data starts at a random point on the wave. Okay, you can see it goes, sometimes it starts at like minus one and a half and maybe one volt plus one volt plus one and a half. So it's bouncing around. So wouldn't it be nice if each scan of data, the waveform started at the same point. So for example, if it always started when the waveform uh, hit the one volt point and it was always starting at one volt and that would kind of hold this to one point. So let's think about how we would implement a triggering function in this application. Well, we can do it in our C sharp application or we can do it in the Arduino sketch. So what we're, we're basically saying is, okay, um, I don't want to see a waveform put on this screen unless the first sample is around one volt. So I always want to start my waveform when the sample is at one volt. So how are you going to do that? Well, um, if we think about the Arduino, uh, we could somehow tell the Arduino, don't start sampling data until your first sample is around one volt or two volts or whatever we want to pick. So all of the all of the bursts of data would have a starting value around one volt. So how would we do that? Well, we've already got the code in the Arduino that says, as soon as I request, no matter where the waveform is at the, the time I request it, start grabbing data. So if it's starting out at minus one, start there. So what we can do is we can tell the Arduino, only start grabbing data if the, the sample that you get is around one volt. And as soon as you get a sample around one volt, start saving that burst of data into an array. Here's our Arduino sketch, and here's our grab, burst, and send. And you can see it's basically immediately going in and reading the values into an array. And there's nothing that stops it from just grabbing data, no matter where the waveform is at the point it starts reading. So what we'd like to do is what we've got in this simple while loop. You can see it's a very simple while loop that says, while this statement is true, do nothing. Okay, so it's just a, a endless while loop that's checking to see if the analog read has a value of less than 500 or another the, the next analog read has a value of greater than say 510. So while it's outside that range of 500 to 510, just loop through and do nothing. However, if it's within the range of 500 to 510, and remember these analog reads are from 0 to 1023, so that would put it about uh, the middle of the analog read, maybe around two and a half volts, if that's zero to five volts. So basically it's saying, if you're in the range of around two and a half volts, get out of this while loop and start reading uh, the samples. Okay, do your analog read for all of those samples that we requested. Otherwise, if it's outside that two and a half volt range, you just keep looping and waiting until it gets inside that range. So you can see it's really pretty straightforward, uh, one line of code and suddenly we have our trigger. So let's try that out and see if it works. So I'm going to upload. So now it's done uploading and I'm going to start my oscilloscope and I'm going to open the port. I'm going to give it uh, 100 samples since that's more likely to bounce around. And I'm going to hit start and wow, it's right there. So you can see it's starting right around two and a half volts and that's DC coupling. So it's right around two and a half volts. Every uh, waveform that it grabs starts at two and a half volts. And I can change the time scale and you can see it locks at two and a half volts to start. So it looks like with that one while loop on the Arduino, we have successfully made a trigger. Now you can go ahead and you can have the user input what the trigger level will be, but in my view, really, this is going to go from 0 to 5 volts, the input, because that's the limit of the Arduino. So triggering at 2.5 volts is probably okay. If you have a signal that's going to go below 2.5 volts, you might want to change it, but you know, you can pick whatever you want. So now let's see how this trigger responds as I change the frequency and the waveform. So I'll go to a sine wave, and you can see it locks right away. 
I'll go to a square wave and that looks pretty good and I'll now change the frequency increase to going up to uh, 1 kilohertz you can see it locks right there so it seems like it works pretty well so now what other features are we going to want to consider so let's say instead of having a nice clean sine wave or a square wave I've got a more typical noisy wave coming into my Arduino and it looks like this. I've got triggering set, but this is all over the place, so it's going to be bouncing around. Let's say I want to grab, I want to take a, a snapshot of that waveform, and maybe I want to save it to a CSV or whatever. How am I going to do that? Well, I've got a button here where it says single, and it basically takes a single snapshot of the waveform, and you can then save it or um, do what you want with it. And then if I hit it again, it toggles and turns it back on. So basically what that does is it turns off the refresh of the waveform. So here is the um, event handler, the button one click for this button. And I call it button one, unfortunately. So button one click, and basically it's just a toggle. And each time you click on it, it toggles. And how does it do a toggle? Well, I have a Boolean which is called is single clicked. So is the single button clicked? And each time you click it, you negate that Boolean. So if it is clicked, when you click it again, it negates that. So sing, is single click becomes false, all right? So it goes from false to true and from true to false. So each time it negates that. So what this says is if the single button is clicked, in other words, I want a snapshot, then what I do is I disable the timer that updates and refreshes the screen. And I just say timer1.enabled equals false. And I change the back color just to highlight that you're in single shot mode. So button1.back color equals color.yellow. However, if it is not clicked, then timer1 is enabled and it goes back to refreshing the screen. And you can see each time I click it, it goes from uh, enable to disable. So it's it's using this Boolean logic to toggle the um, Boolean. All right. So really pretty straightforward and nice way to get a snapshot. You can then go ahead and maybe if you want to save that waveform as a CSV. I've got videos we've done before on how to save CSVs. Uh, pretty straightforward. So what else do we want to do uh, as far as features? So another thing I want to briefly touch on is what we talked about before, the limited SRAM, limited memory on the Arduino Uno and the Nano. It's basically got 2048 bytes. And what that limits you in is the number of samples per scan. And you can see here we've got 500 samples per scan. And originally when we were thinking about using the time and voltage values for each sample, we learned that we couldn't even get like 500 samples. So what we had to do was just not grab the time values for each sample, but only the voltage values, and then send those voltage values to the C-sharp application, and it would recreate the time values for each sample. So we didn't use all that uh, RAM, that SRAM on the Arduino. So we were able to get up to about 500 samples per scan. However, if you care, there is another way to get more RAM and to get a lot more samples. Now again, um, I don't know if that's going to help you out. I'm mean, getting more samples. Keep in mind, each sample takes time. So if you get a lot more samples, it's going to take a lot more time for a scan. So maybe it will help you if you want to do long-term scans or something. Um, I haven't found much use for it, but again, if you use uh, an Arduino Mega, and you can see I've got a Mega connected here on COM8. If you use an Arduino Mega, it's got 8K of RAM as opposed to the 2K on the uh, Uno. So with an 8K, um, you can get something like four times as much RAM, which means about four times as many samples per scan. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close the port and disconnect the uh, Mega and enter two, one, two, three samples. And you can see I'm here on 100 milliseconds and I'm going to open it up again and I'm gonna now grab 2,000 samples per scan. And you can see now I'm up to 400 milliseconds. 
So it increased the, the scan time by a factor of four because it has to fit in a lot more samples per scan. So um, yeah, you can get a lot more samples, um, but you can see, you know, I turn the markers on and there's just a, a billion samples here. So does it really help? Um, that's up to you. Again, here's my markers and I've got 2000 samples in this 40 milliseconds. So yeah, you get more samples, but it takes a lot more time to do it. So it's up to you. But again, Arduino Omega has got 8K of uh, RAM if you can use it. So now briefly, let's cover these readouts at the top of the screen where we have average volts and we have max volts. Uh, I'm going to leave the frequency for a, a future video. It's a little bit more complex. But average volts, max volts, and also this AC and DC coupling, they're all kind of related and they're actually very simple to implement. Now, average volts, you can imagine, um, I've got a big array for each scan. I've got an array of, in this case, 500 values. So average volts just amounts to going through the array of values and getting the average. Basically, the sum of all the values divided by the number of values gives you the average. So pretty straightforward. AC and DC coupling basically uses this average volts. So if I'm in DC and I want to get AC coupling, I just need to go through each element and subtract this average value, and that will bring it down to zero, okay? So you can see average volts and AC DC coupling are pretty straightforward. Again, a very simplistic approach, but it works uh, reasonably well. And um, also maximum volts, you can imagine, I've got an array of values. I just go through and figure out the maximum of all those. Uh, there's a bunch of ways to do that. We're gonna do a very simplistic approach. So now in our main uh, Windows Forms application, when the timer goes through and, and every scan, it sends out an event, it will read this Arduino burst and that calls, at the end of that, it calls this process data burst. And here's the process data burst. And here's where it updates those um, displays every scan. You get the max value, the average value, and frequency, which we'll talk about. And to do that, it basically goes into our input data processor class and runs these methods. So let's go to the input data processor and look at the methods. And um, first of all, the average, which is the most important because we use it in a couple places, um, we zero out the sum and it basically goes through this process double array, goes through each element and gets a sum of all the values. And at the end, it gets the sum of all the values and divides that by the length of the array and that gives you an average. So basically the total sum over the number of elements gives you the average. And again, that's used in our, um, in getting the average and also in this AC coupled. So if we go into the get AC coupled, we see that we go through each element in the array and just subtract out the average from the element value. Now the maximum, get max, uh, it zeroes out the maximum voltage value and it goes through each element. And if this um, element is greater than the max voltage, you replace max voltage with the element value. If not, you keep going through. Very simplistic way. There's easier ways to do it. Um, you know, you can convert this to a list. You can do all kinds of stuff and get the max, but this is just one way to do it. Seems very intuitive. Okay, so next I want to focus on these track bars. So what do the track bars do? Well, they basically adjust the horizontal and vertical scale. So for example, right now I've got uh, minus five to five volts on the vertical voltage scale, and I've got a scale factor of one, and I can adjust this, I can bring it down, and instead of one, I can go up to 0 0.1, so now it's 0 0.5 to minus 0 0.5, and I can just, I can zoom in and now I've got a 0.6, so it goes from 3 to minus 3. And likewise, with the uh, horizontal or time scale, I'm now set to a 10 millisecond scan time, and I can increase that, and now I'm up to 100 milliseconds, and you can see it updates the scan time displayed on the scope, and I can go up to 200 milliseconds. So in real time, and that's important, in real time, it adjusts 
the displayed scan time of each refresh, okay? Now I'm gonna focus on this horizontal or time scale. So let's think about what this is actually doing. Well, as I said, in real time, as you adjust it, it is updating the maximum scan time. So here we've got 500 samples per scan, and with my track bar set to minimum, or 10 milliseconds, it's doing 500 samples in 10 milliseconds. And as I increase it up to say 100 milliseconds, it's doing 500 samples in 100 milliseconds. So what do you think it's actually doing under the hood? Well, it's updating in real time the value that describes the burst duration in milliseconds. And the timer, the system timer that updates this, and you can see it's updating the system timer is updating this display every 220, 230 milliseconds. You can see down here in the debug. And as I adjust this down, where I'm seeing now 10 milliseconds, it changes the timer interval to, in this case, 130 milliseconds. And as I increase this, it changes the timer interval up to 330 milliseconds. As I scroll this track bar, it is generating an event and the event handler is recalculating the burst duration in milliseconds that is used to set the timer interval, okay? So it's just changing the value so that we can feed a new value to the timer so that it updates the display in a different time. So let's go take a look at the code and see what it's doing. So here I'm in my main Windows forms. I'm gonna to go to the event handlers and I'm gonna scroll down and the scan time track bar, which you can see on our display is this TRK scan time. So my event handler for that is basically just two lines of code. So as we said, it's gonna recalculate the burst duration in milliseconds, depending on the position of the track bar. And then it's gonna feed that new value to the timer to reset the timer interval. Every time I scroll the track bar, it's gonna reset the timer interval to the desired interval. And it's also going to add our scan time buffer in milliseconds. And we generally default this to like 50 milliseconds or something. And it's just our safety margin uh, that we're adding to each burst duration so that we make sure we get the, the scan finished before we start a new scan. So it's just calculating the burst duration in milliseconds and feeding that as the new timer interval. So what is the burst duration milliseconds? Well, it's the number of samples, which is what is uh, input by the user, in this case, 500 samples per scan, times the milliseconds per sample. And as we know, that depends on whether you have your sketch written to enable high-speed mode, which we've got here, this checkbox, or it's the default um, analog read time. So we've got this milliseconds per sample and the number of samples, and then we take the track bar scan time value, and that's gonna be, in this case, a value from one to 20. So it's an arbitrary value, but you can see if we select this track bar, you can set the minimum and the maximum value. So when I'm down here at minimum, the value is one. You can see it gives you a one. At maximum, it gives you 20. And that's arbitrary. I just chose uh, 20 as the maximum. But at a minimum, it will be one and maximum is 20. So it's basically going to take that number of samples times milliseconds per sample and multiply it by one, a value between one and 20. Now, it's very important, as we said before, we want to make sure that at the minimum, we allow for the fact, in this case, 500 samples per scan in high speed mode is going to take a certain amount of time to accomplish, okay? Each sample is going to take like 0.1 milliseconds or 0.02 milliseconds. So we got to make sure that we don't allow the user to run the track bar below a value that will be too short for this to accomplish all 500 samples. So with 500 samples per scan, if I'm in high speed mode, that's 0.02 milliseconds per sample 
So 0 0.02 times 500 will give you the 10 milliseconds minimum times. So basically that's it. You just take the number of samples times the millisecond per sample and multiply that times the track scan time value, which in our case is between 1 and 20, and then feed that value to the timer interval with the additional buffer time, and that's about it. The vertical scale is even simpler. We're just setting the y-axis maximum as the vertical scale value. So that's just going to be a multiplier with the y-axis. Okay, so in the next video, we're going to talk about this frequency measurement. We're going to talk about a couple ways to implement that. And um, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, so I put it in a separate video. Um, anyway, if you like any of these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe and hit the bell notifications. And most of all, let others know that we're here so we get some more viewers. Really appreciate it. Otherwise, take care and have a really good day. Thanks.